Today we're in Greenwich Village in New York City. My name's Nick Potts, I'm an architect, and we're going to be doing a walking tour of the neighborhood. When New York City first started, the main city was really centered around Wall Street, and that's where people lived, and it's where people um, worked. This was, uh, it was farmland in the far hinterlands. And because it was outside of the city, this is where things that weren't seen as desirable ended up, like Washington Square Park, which at one time was the potter's field, which was the cemetery where if you couldn't afford a proper burial, uh, you would end up here. When this was redeveloped in the 1820s, the, ostensibly they were supposed to remove a lot of the bodies, but it's been estimated there are still 20,000 burials underground. And actually when they built the arch, they discovered quite a few. So there's definitely uh, another, another city underneath that we're not really aware of in, the, in its current incarnation. So this existed right around the same time that the commissioner's plan laid out the street grid, which is why the streets don't quite align with the number of streets and avenues that we currently think of, with the exception of Fifth Avenue, which is the centerpiece that shoots right through the arch. Essentially everything to the north of here was part of the commissioner's plan. The original idea of Washington Square Park when it was redeveloped away from being a cemetery was as a front yard for townhouse developments, such as the one on the right, which was built in the 1830s. When this was redeveloped and those townhouses were built, the upper classes felt comfortable moving up here. The arch itself is uh, kind of interesting. Uh, it was originally built as a temporary arch out of plaster, which is a common thing. And, you know, During the World's Fairs, a lot of the buildings were built out of this material, which is called staff, it's simply because it was quick and fast and cheap. This one and quite a few World's Fair buildings in other cities that became permanent, they would have to rebuild out of marble. And it was really rebuilt because it was popular and it became a rallying point in this newly established a relatively newly established park is a focal point. And it's also one of the only moments urbanistically in New York where we have a termination of a street. So it makes sense. Like in Paris with the Champs-Élysées and the Arc de Triomphe, we have our little Washington Square arch. Right now we're on Washington Square North, right in front of one of the most important Greek Revival townhouse developments in New York. So the houses are almost perfect examples of Greek Revival style. You can see the columns at the porticos. The fences have Greek motifs such as keys and anthemions, which are the kind of flowery shapes on top of the fences. Everything here is intact from the 1830s. So it's really a remarkable achievement in preservation and how the city has kind of kept its best buildings. When these were first built, they were really meant to be upper class residences, kind of the upper crust of society did live in these. Uh, eventually they became a little bit more bohemian, artists would move in, but the fabric of the buildings is, you know, at least from the street front, totally intact. So they were redeveloped in the 1930s uh, by NYU, who is the majority landholder here, uh, into an apartment building. But remarkably, even though there's essentially a whole new building behind them, you don't really see it. That all happens behind the facade. In what looks like a series of individual townhouses with their own front door, there's an apartment building that's accessed via a side entrance on Fifth Avenue. So the stoops, the marble paving, the fences, they're all pretty much as they were in 1833. And really the only telltale sign is the fact the corner sign is just slightly higher to seek in another floor. Right now we're on West 11th Street in Greenwich Village. So if you've spent a lot of time in the village, you've probably realized there's not a lot of new buildings. And generally, if there's a new building, there's a pretty good reason why. Case in point, the Weatherman House. In 1970, there was a bombing in this place by an anti-Vietnam War activist group. Hence that building no longer existed. And given the fact that the village is heavily landmarked, the conflict about what to build in its place became a really heated event. So the village was essentially baked in amber in the 1960s when it became the first major neighborhood in Manhattan that was given landmark status. So that meant is every building is assessed and its characters are defined. And you really can't change anything beyond that without going to landmarks and going, getting major approval. When you're applying to landmarks, there's a lot of assessment about window types, window profiles of the sashes and material. And here you, know, you can see the red brick is essentially the same as what you see elsewhere. So, you know, they would want to look at that and make sure that it's contextual with the rest of the buildings on the street. The bombing was in 1970. I believe it, this building was designed in 1970 and not built until 1978. So you can imagine the sort of negotiations just to get something like this built in a you know, post landmarked Greenwich Village. What's really 1970s and postmodern about this is that it's playing around with shape and kind of taking the motifs of the historic architecture and almost making it um, a cut and paste, like a 
almost a joke on itself. So, you know, the top of the building, you know, if you kind of cut off the top, that's a federal townhouse. But then uh, Hugh Hardy, the architect, twisted the main front, uh, sensibly to give the rooms more light. So it's playing around with the idea of, you know, what would a federal townhouse in 1978, which was when this was built, look like. Right now we're on West A Street, outside of the first home of the Whitney Museum of American Art. So this building is really an important moment in the change of Greenwich Village from a residential neighborhood for the well-off to a neighborhood for Bohemians. So these three buildings were originally three Greek Revival townhouses built in the 1830s. In the 1930s, Gertrude Vanderbilt Whitney bought these and combined them into one single house and a studio. And then in the late 1930s, they eventually became a museum. There's a studio in the back facing McDougal Alley. Because she was an amateur artist, she wanted a place where she could make art and live amongst artists and still have her the trappings of a large house. Eventually, this became the Whitney Museum, and this is the studio school, but you can still see the building as it is looks much as it did. What's interesting is that even though it looks like one building, it is still very clearly three separate townhouses. You can see the three bays of each, and it's been unified under this pink stucco facade with a monumental, very art deco entrance with the eagle. So it's a mix of the 1830s and 1930s styles. So you see a lot of the motifs of Art Deco style. You see fluting, you see abstracted, kind of vaguely classical motifs, but everything is very kind of abstracted, softened, and almost sanded down. The original federal townhouses weren't you know, seen as being a contemporary or artistic aesthetic, and so you see these reshapings. But because this was in style in 1931, we've got a 1931 facade on what were 100-year-old buildings at the time. Right now we're on Waverly Place between 6th Avenue and the park. So in the 1920s, there was a huge trend for bohemians to move into the village. The developers of these buildings were trying to appeal to the creative class and kind of remake these fusty 1830s buildings into something new and contemporary, oftentimes using very kind of fantastical styles. And the building behind me is a really great example of this. It's really stylistically, it's somewhere between like a Jugendstil European style, Art Deco, it's maybe a little bit Flemish. It's just doing a whole lot. It's really to project nothing else than fun and whimsy. And a building like this, which was renovated in the 1920s, was really taking the ideas of someone named Frederick Cerner, who was renovating buildings around Gramercy Park in a similar sort of neo-Mediterranean European style. The windows that were used in these, we see a lot in Greenwich Village. It was these studio windows. And so you think about the narrow vertical slits of a Greek Revival townhouse, really not conducive to painting. And so even if these weren't fully marketed towards artists, the horizontal paned window projected studio and creativity. Right now we are on the corner of Grove Street where it meets 7th Avenue. So this is one of these kind of amazing scars of Greenwich Village as it was being integrated into the street grid of New York City. And the building back to my left is kind of a perfect example of that. You can see where the 7th Avenue literally sliced off a corner of the building and they kept the front and kind of exposed the side. 7th Avenue was sliced through the existing Greenwich Village fabric in the 1920s, primarily to run the independent subway underneath. But to do that, there was obviously a cost. And to this day, 7th Avenue doesn't quite have the same density or the feeling of the rest of the village, frankly, because it, there are these weird moments where you're looking at the backs and sides of buildings that had never been meant to be seen. They literally would just demolish a corner of the building and slap a corner of new facade on it. Thankfully, that one, probably the reason that that building was preserved rather than torn down, is at the door where the stair is. The red brick on the left, that was the front of the building. And it would have had two more windows like any other New York City fabric building, it's three bays wide. The more brownish brick on the right, that was never meant to be seen. It was a light court, that was a tenement building, so you can kind of see the where the apartment had a light shaft. On, on most brick buildings, there's usually a face brick on the facade side, which is, has a slightly higher level of finish, maybe a nicer glaze, maybe a prime spot in the oven, versus the brick that's used on the back of a building, which is much more work a day, you know, kind of just kind of raw clay without any additives or any kind of thought about its appearance. You can kind of understand the economics of a brick building where you don't want to spend money on things people don't see. Even though these moments are kind of awkward, it's really a great, you know, almost like an x-ray snapshot into the workings of our city. Right now we're on the corner of Bedford Street and Commerce Street outside the oldest house in the village. So this is a really a very classic late 18th century federal style. The detailing is incredibly simple. The lintels of the windows rather than a, a very kind of carved expression or frankly even a brick arch. 
they're a slab of stone. So it's a very kind of almost like rudimentary means of construction. It's simple, it's straightforward, it's honest. That sort of recessed door, you see them in some of these federal style houses. Again, it's a very simple expression. You're not seeing a portico or a sort of porches. Because of that, you don't have shelter. And so the shelter is really happening within the footprint of the house. What's really interesting about this one, unlike others, is that you see the exposed sidewall and these two almost like peepholes that are showing where the hearths are. So it has two fireplaces, kind of a classic sidewall expression. But again, we don't usually see this on a corner, so it's interesting to kind of have that revealed to us. And the wood is covering everything else. The building is brick frame. So it's a little bit strange why they would have applied the siding, but if the chimneys were exposed, you would see the vertical line going all the way up to the roof. And here, we're just seeing where the fireplace is. This interestingly was modified in the early 20th century. So it has our studio window, again, to appeal to a new bohemian class. So even though this house is very old and it's in a great state of preservation, it still has been modified for a new lifestyle. So these houses were almost always two and a half stories when they were first built. As the land became more valuable, as people became aware of the fact that they could rent out apartments within their townhouses, you'll see these expansions into fully three-story buildings, sometimes going even into four-story buildings. A street like this, that's primarily, you know, 1799 through 1830, the expansions happen, you know, in the 1850s and beyond. So a house like this, typically uh, a federal and Greek revival townhouse will have a Flemish bond where the brick is horizontal and short. And that's because the brick of these buildings is several layers thick and it's a way of weaving the layers of brick together. When you see expansions of these houses, you almost inevitably see a change in the brick type to a more common bond, which is a, a standard horizontal, horizontal, horizontal with a stretcher course where the tying together happens essentially every four or five rows rather than within the weaving of the brick. And it's a great way of telling whether a house has been expanded vertically. So you're seeing, you know, changes happen. Sometimes you can date a building that had a vertical expansion to its cornice. If it has an Italianate cornice, which is more curvy and superfluous, that tells you this happened, you know, in the 1860s and the 1870s. So you can kind of read a bit of the kind of prevailing styles and what's going on with the expansions. Right now we're on the corner of Grove and Christopher Streets in the West Village. So right now we're in kind of the heart of the more bohemian parts of the village. So neighborhoods like this were exactly what Jane Jacobs, when she was writing about these sorts of neighborhoods, was talking about. There's eyes on the street, there's liveliness, there's a diversity of types of uses, types of people, and that's really what causes the stability of a neighborhood like this, is there's enough to adapt and shift over time. You see you know, restaurants at the bases of buildings, so there's activity on 24-7. We have buildings like the Northern Dispensary that are serving a community need. This one, in fact, had been here since the 1830s as a free community clinic. Very simple kind of workaday sort of buildings. You see some kind of high style details on a civic building like the Northern Dispensary. You see, again, our Greek key motif and our Aranthemion in the, in the ironwork. But otherwise, it's a pretty simple, straightforward red brick building. When this was, you know, originally you know, developed in the 1830s were, you know, they were working people. They were people who worked in brass foundries, places like P. Guerin that's still in business up on, up on Jane Street. Bricklayers, house painters, uh, people who worked in the docks more towards the river. So it's really a, a neighborhood for, for people to um, live and live their everyday lives. These were originally townhouses uh, and residential buildings. And that's kind of the beauty of these, you know, 20 foot townhouses is it's a really great module for creating a storefront on the ground floor and kind of a testament to the adaptability of this building type. A neighborhood like this has almost become the victim of its own success. You know, you've noticed it hasn't changed since the 1960s because to preserve it, to keep it from becoming something else, it had to become, you know, essentially you know, baked as it, in its final form. <laughs> 